If your vision calls for increasing the scale or scope of Scala-based technology, Micronautics Research, the Scala Enablement Company, can help your organization succeed with Scala projects on time and on budget. Micronautics Research offers mentoring, training, software development, and cutting-edge publications. Thank you all for coming. I'm David Pollack. Um, this is a new and different presentation for me. First time I've done it, so I'm gonna trip over my tongue. Please don't laugh too much. Please don't throw too much stuff at me. Um, so about me, I've done tons of Scala. I've been doing Scala for over six years. Um, I founded the Lyft Web Framework. I um, sponsored and built and created the first uh, Scala-related conferences, blah, 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 blah. Um, done a couple of commercial spreadsheets, uh, the first real-time spreadsheet for Next Step called Mesa, um, an OS2 spreadsheet back in the day, um, Integer, which was a Java-powered distributed um, server client mumbledy blah 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 spreadsheet, um, tech passionate, lawyer trained, and an industry veteran, otherwise known as an old guy. Um, I also wrote Beginning Scala, which was uh, published about, I guess, three and a half years ago. Um, it's a dated but uh, gentle introduction to Scala. Um, I actually, as part of this presentation, went and looked for PDF copy, and I had my, the PDF copy that the publisher had sent to me, which was DRM'd, and I couldn't for the life of me remember the password. So um, Russian hackers and Google are my friend because I found some guy who had an un-DRM copy of it. Uh, on the internet. Um, so I do consulting for a living. I help manage the Lyft community. Uh, my current fund is a CMS, a content management system that's powered by Lyft and, uh, Lyft and Hoisted. Hoisted was a little um, content thingy that I did so that we could produce the Lyft website and that sort of thing. And I morphed it into something more um, and put it underneath Telegram so that we can actually um, allow users to publish Markdown and Word and pages and HTML files into co a coherent whole website. Um, basically, it's better, faster, and cooler than Postris, and it's not dead. Um, next thing is, uh, this is a caveat. I've done a whole ton over the years of Scala advocacy. Um, I've also been called in as a consultant to clean up uh, more than one Scala project gone sideways. And so I will say choose Scala wisely. Um, Scala can be very challenging for large organizations. There's the version fragility issue. So if you're using Scala, you, basically everybody who's writing libraries and everybody in your organization either has to cross-publish versions or be on the same version and having managed scalatools.org for many years and also continuing to manage the Lyft project, the being able to have like a whole chain of build dependencies so that you can actually get stuff published, it's hard. Um, Scala's type system is incredibly powerful and I will call it Perlesque. There are eight different ways of doing anything. Oh, is that an implicit parameter you're showing me or is it a type bound? I don't know. Um, so in the right hands, like uh, Miles Savin, who has created um, Shapeless, the type system is awesome. In other hands, it's not. Um, there's also continuing weak tools problem. IntelliJ 12 is really a usable, decent IDE, but that's very late in coming. Um, and there's still tons of problems with the standard libraries. So, you know, the Parser combinators are not thread safe. Oh, whoops. Um, the XML node seek libraries are under maintained. You know, you can got, kind of go through the stuff. And if you know where the landmines are, if you've got an awesome team that can deal with it, you can rock with Scala like no other language in the whole planet. But if you don't, it's not a panacea. So that's my um, 
caveat so that people don't go, Dave, you told me to do Scala, and I did, and, and look at these problems. It's like, now I told you. Anyway, so we're here to talk about something else, which is the unicorn. Now, unicorns are these magical beasts. They fly, they bring happiness and peace to the world. They fart rainbows, you know, all of this stuff. What we've been looking for, at least in the 35 or so years I've been doing professional computing, we've been looking for that unicorn. We've been looking for a composition where team A makes some pieces and team B takes those pieces and assembles them gracefully into a wonderful working piece of software that works in the first time. And then team C can pick up that glorious code base and go, ah, I know exactly what it's supposed to do. Our requirements have changed a bit, so I will push a button here and poof, the system will work correctly. So this whole idea of composition, of taking these pieces and putting them together into a whole that is stable and solid and maintainable and upgradable is, is the, the rainbow, the unicorn, that thing that we've been chasing throughout um, computing. And back, 20 odd years ago when I was started doing Next Step and when C++ was coming into vogue and Object Pascal was the way that some people, yes, somebody back there laughed, Object Pascal, <laughs> was the way that we did software on Lisa computers. Um, my God, I'm so old. Uh, the, the idea was different than C where you had some data structures and then you had some functions that operated on those data structures. It was different because you had your data and your logic and your code, where your code, co code represented your logic, all encapsulated into one thing. And more importantly, we generally hid the data. We generally hid the way that the code maintained state away from everybody. So as Marius pointed out, no, 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 Impl implementation details, you don't get those, dude, because if I give you some implementation details, you'll use them. You'll use them, and then it will be harder for me to manage my libraries. The unicorn qualities that people were talking about with objects were they snap together like Legos. And I actually did a fun Google search. Snap together like Legos, object orientation. Hit number three the Java tutorial. <laughs> so, you know, Java was supposed to be this OO language where you had your right interfaces and you had your right object implementations and if you needed to change something, you merely subclassed something and all was wonderful and then, but wait a minute, this, this library over here wants to construct an instance of this thing but I really want it to construct my subclass instance. So then we got factories. But then we realized that factories were not enough because we needed factories to create factories. And then we needed to subclass the created factories. You guys are laughing, good. And you know, it didn't work in that kind of magic unicorny way. And I, I shouldn't say that it didn't work at all because there, there are some places in very coarse grain objects where OO works well. You know, modeling, very coarse grain stuff, it works well. Modeling, when you spend a ton of time doing your modeling up front, you can generally get okay results. So if anybody's had the pleasure of going through and looking at the small talk libraries, looking at the squeak implementation, some of the object hierarchies and inheritance and the way that um, the squeak implementation is done, uh, the UI components, the way the squeak implementation is done, the collections classes, and a lot of the stuff is bubbled into, um, sorry, I was about to say next step. Um, OS X, AppKit, and um, iOS development. That sort of stuff kind of works out okay. It also generally works out better when you're using a unitype language, when you're using a language where the compiler actually enforces the calls. It gets a lot harder. Um, and quite frankly, in my experience, OO has never really worked well outside of the toy, ex toy examples. So there are a couple of things about why kind of scratching my head going, okay, you know, I can't just say it's not a unicorn. I can't just say um, factory factories and make people laugh. I actually have to talk about the why. And one of the things that I've realized about OO is OO assumes flow of control 
So it assumes that you're actually calling and being called and calling and being called in the whole stack hierarchy, uh, the, the um, call hierarchy. And that actually turns out to be really challenging, especially when you get into systems where you've got multiple cores, where you're dealing with futures, where you're doing stuff where the computation is not one linear call chain, but the computation is spread over time. The computation may, in the case of some systems like Erlang, be spread over address spaces. You actually can't assume the call stack. And when you start assuming the call stack like OO does, which is, okay, I've got these methods and somebody will call these methods, but I'm gonna pass myself, I'm gonna pass the current this as the implicit parameter. And so the current this will get a method called at some point in the future or at some point during the call chain and I'll either update my state or return a value or something. You can't really assume that anymore. It also um, really requires mutability because if your state is an object and your state um, is called by something else and kind of your state, your world has to kind of look at the local stuff, it has to change that local stuff in its private variable space, in its private kind of state space. And that's kind of difficult if you have a single CPU. Well, hell, hell is difficult. Um, and you know, it's like, it, look at a lot of the problems that we have with um, uh, the software that we write and the kind of uh, failures that we have and failures that don't manifest themselves in testing. And those failures very often are a result of mutability. Somebody changes something out from underneath somebody else. And actually my favorite example of this is the implicit, uh, free, the, impl that, the implicit freeze boundary of an object. So one of the things in Java land is you basically create an object and then you set a bunch of variables or set a bunch of values on the object and then you either pass the object off as a reference to something else and that something else performs computation looking at the state that you've passed in or alternatively the object, you call some methods on the object and it looks at its state. Okay, that's all great when the team is small and everybody knows where that implicit right boundary is. The implicit boundary of when we pass that object off into compute land. The only problem is the new guy comes along and goes, oh wow, this thing has a set name method. Well, I'll just call it. Unfortunately, <laughs> the guy called it after the object's been set, sent into compute land. So some of the compute land stuff has the name before the, the new guy set the name instance. And some of the compute has the wrong name and hilarity or your boss turning purple and yelling, who did this, ensues. It becomes impossible when you have multiple cores because when you have multiple cores in mutable state, you wind up in this place where you have to figure out exactly where your lock boundary is. So do I have a fine grain lock? Do I lock on a particular field in a particular object? Do I lock the particular object? Do I lock an interlocking set of particular objects? Do I, the the finer grain you get, the more likely you have deadlocks. The coarser grain you get, the more likely you have the Python runtime. Um, ooh, I can piss on another language in the room full of Scala guys. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, this is being broadcast, shit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's basically, you wind up with that, that um, coarseness versus fineness um, tension for locking. And the other problem is that when you have these interlocking calls, if the guy who wrote the library doesn't give you that one important method to subclass, you're toast. Now in the world of open source, you're less toast than you used to be because in the world of open source, you basically grab the source, you copy and paste the source code of the method as it was originally implemented and you fix the implementation to do what you want. But you know, it didn't used to work that way. You can't always get the source code, and even when you do that, if the guy, if the library author realizes that there's a more efficient way of doing stuff, something, you don't get those efficiencies automatically copied and pasted into your code when the library is updated. So kind of all of the callback, method name, um, interlocking, um, mutation of state 
has not served us well outside of user interfaces. And I'll kind of get to that in a minute, because user interfaces are, I think, a, gen a special case. Um, the problem is exacerbated in uh, Scala land with, a sin with single inheritance. So with single inheritance, you only get one shot at the implementation. Sorry, I'm about to break into m and Get one shot, take it. Um, and so what you wind up doing is you wind up having these interfaces that if you're using Eclipse, Eclipse will kindly, when you implement an interface, fit, copy and paste and fill in the code for you. But not all things do that. But what you wind up with is code duplication all over the place. And what is worse than code duplication, you wind up with logic duplication all over the place. And as your logic evolves, which it will, as your team evolves, which it will, somebody's going to forget to copy and paste that last bit of revised logic into that last place. So then you go into refactoring. OK, what we're going to do is we're going to have the static implementation of the right logic sitting in one place in static land, and each of our um, trait, I'm sorry, each of our interfaces that implement the particular um, method, well, rather than having the code copied and pasted, we're just going to call into that one logic place, except the guy who forgets to do that. But what it winds up meaning is that the isolation of the logic is difficult. And when you don't have logic isolation, you don't have unicorns. Um, there's also another problem with single inheritance, which is that you wind up with tons and tons and tons of uh, single uh, interfaces with single methods. So you see this all, the, all over um, AWT land. You see this um, basically any time when you're going to have a callback where the thing that you're calling into doesn't really know the class that's calling it. So it basically defines the callback method, the on event, the on foo, whatever. So you wind up with a proliferation of interfaces that have a single method. And you also wind up in your code with a proliferation of anonymous interclasses, which both, you know, the anonymous interclasses are just a lot more line noise than you need. And the individual interfaces, while useful before uh, Java 1.5 when there were no generics, are really not useful anymore. So what do we want? We actually want to separate our data from our logic. Now, there, that's different than separating the namespaces, and I'll actually get to that in a future slide. But we want to separate, we want to be able to isolate our logic. And one of the things that winds up happening in OO land is that you're able to separate um, coarse grain large chunks of logic into uh, places where it can be genericized or where it can be useful um, or used across a wide number of uh, calls. But a lot of that lo those little pieces wind up being in copied and pasted code duplication. So I'll get in a minute to the example where we take the average of something. Um, we also want state mostly on the heap. And we want that state that's on the heap to only be referenceable by references to the, tr um, to the tree of state. And that once you have a reference, that tree of state will not change. So it's called a persistent reference in um, OO literature. And I don't know where it came from. But anyway, so basically a persistent reference is when I have a reference to about a persistent value, that value is guaranteed not to change during the execution of the program. So in Java land, string is never having to say synchronized. You have a reference to a string. The string ain't never going to change out from under you. And we not only live with that in Java land, but we thrive on that in Java land. Yeah, 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 yes. For some implementations, we care about um, optimizing for performance. And for those implementations, we'll create a local string buffer, which is mutable. And we'll shovel strings into the string buffer, and we'll build something up. But in, the, in our normal course of operating, we get a string. And we may concatenate the string with another string, and we may do some other stuff and pass it around. But we never worry about locking it. We never worry about making defensive copies of it. Now imagine if most of your data structures in your program, in fact, most of the data structures that your program exposed to other, um, to other parts of the system were persistent as well. So you're guaranteed once you have a reference, you don't have to lock it, you don't have to make defensive copies of it, 
you just you own that graph of objects, and that graph of objects is bedrock. We also want to be able to compose our code into executable pipelines. And you literally want to say, do this, and then do this, and then do this. And it becomes, um, as a type signature, thing, you know, input, output. And as you compose those things together, you may compose them based on um, logic that's determined at runtime. So, you know, use this code, and then this code, and then this code. Oh, the user wants mean rather than median for um, taking the average, whatever. If you can slot those pieces in and compose them into a computational pipeline that you then pass as a um, parameter to something else that actually performs a computation on the data set, that's an entirely different way of looking at code rather than I'm gonna be called and then I'm gonna call and then somebody else is gonna call me and then I'm gonna have my method invoked and then I'm gonna change my local variable. In fact, everybody who's used Unix, okay, who here has never uh, been at a bash prompt or another Unix prompt? Okay, good, so we've got all Mac and Linux and you know the one guy who goes, yeah, I've been using Windows since 82. Um, okay, um, so let's actually compose a calculator. So what, this is one of my favorite pieces of code because it's a full four-function calculator, including full implementation, that will take any string of any arbitrary length containing numbers, uh, pluses, minuses, times, divide, and parentheses, and compute a result. So let's kind of go through it. And we have our object calc. This is why I had to go get uh, beginning Scala because this example was in beginning Scala and I'm like, woo, I remember that example. Now where was it again? Oh, let me just find the book. So what we have is we have a calculator that extends Java token parsers, and Java token parsers is part of the Scala parser combinator library. By the way, Andrew, like, tell me about 10 minutes before I run out of time. I'm good? Good. I'll babble on forever. You know, you guys will like die, turn to dust. You know, the 111 Mina people will come in and go, why are all these dead people in the room? Oh, David's still talking. Um, so Java token parsers is a parser Part, uh, subclass of the standard parser combinator library in the Scala standard libraries. And what it does is it's able to uh, parse uh, Java tokens. And there's one place where we use it, which is down here, which is if we have a floating point number, if we have our input stream that matches a floating point number, then we convert the string to a double. But other than that, this is all just standard Scala parser combinator stuff. So let's go up to the top. We have a sum expression. And a sum expression is a product expression followed by some stuff. A product expression is a factor followed by some stuff. And a factor is either a number or it's a parenthesis followed by a sum expression. So basically what we've done is we have this recursive description of what our parser is supposed to parse. So if we got a number, great, that's like the core thing. If we don't got a number, let's look for some parentheses and a sum expression. And if we look up at the sum expression, we can see it repeats either a plus or a minus. So we have our product expression, which is going to be some kind of double. It, basically our product expression reduces to a double. And followed by a plus sign followed by another product expression. So it's one plus one. So what do we do when we get this? We take and we return, uh, we take a function that has our double number and we return a function which is, uh, which takes a parameter and adds it to the double number that we found. Same thing for the minus. Now one of the other things that you'll see over here is that we have the rep, which says repeat. So this will repeat um, zero or more times. Hmm. Should probably be a rep one, but anyway. Um, so once we have that expression, we're gonna reduce it by taking our seed, which is the double return by product expression, or the double parse by product expression, 
and our list of pluses and minus functions. And we're going to fold over the functions. So what this does is this says, OK, take our seed number. And using our seed number and the function that was returned from our list, apply the function to the seed number. So if we have 1 plus 1 our, or 1 plus 2, our seed will be 1. And then our expression will be a function that takes a double number and adds 2 to it. So over here, that will result in the number 3. We have the same thing over here. Now, you'll notice that we haven't called ourselves. We've referenced ourselves, but we haven't made any method calls. We haven't done anything that requires subclassing. We have something that is pretty declarative, both in terms of what we're looking for. Yeah, OK, it looks like line noise, but you know, give it a few weeks, and it'll look declarative to you, too. Um, <laughs> By the way, I've been doing some Haskell as well. And all the Haskell guys go, oh, this is just so obvious. And it's like, OK, less than star greater than. Or anybody who's done Scala Z. Oh, it's applicative. I should have known. Um, so yeah, it's not, all, um, it's not all perfect. But you pick up Smalltalk or Objective-C. You pick up C++. You pick up Java. Most of those languages, until you're, you're comfortable with the syntax, most of them will look like line noise. Or Perl, which always looks like line noise, but that's something else entirely. So anyway, what we have here is we actually have a full functioning thing that will not only parse a calculator grammar, but will actually um, compute a number. And the cool thing is that um, the type signature of this is parser of double. But parser of double is actually um, a function that takes a string and returns, well, actually, it's a parse result. But I couldn't fit parse result into the line, so I replaced it with box. It's basically, it returns an optional uh, value or an error. So you shove um, this whole thing. So if you basically say, OK, um, calc.factor pass in a string. If the string is parsable at, within this grammar, you'll get a number back. If it's not parsable, you'll get some sort of error telling you where the parsing failed. So this is an example of multi-level functional composition. So we've composed the functions that uh, perform the parsing, because the parser combinator is actually just functional compositioning functional composition. We also composed functions. We returned functions over here as part of the conversion. And we composed those functions by folding over them to actually perform the computation. So it's, what's that thing wrapped in an enigma? Whatever, anyway. So. One of the nice things about Scala, and too bad they didn't think of this for Java 1.5, is a beautiful universal type signature, which is um, a function that takes an A and returns a B. So you can take that function signature and replace a whole host of single method interfaces in Java land with that nice bit of signature, which is, OK, you give me something, and I'm going to return something. Now, sometimes B is unit, which is you're going to give me something and I'm going to return void. Sometimes that um, B is nothing, which is you're going to give me something and I'm never going to return, I promise. Um, and actually, the Scala compiler enforces the return value of nothing by saying that you actually have to throw an exception. Um, you can't return nothing from a method. It's actually fun to say that. You can also say nothing is a superclass of, I'm sorry, nothing is a subclass of everything. That's also a true statement. Um, sorry, sometimes I amuse myself. Um, what we can also do is we can define a series of functions. So something that converts a string, um, transforms a string to a string. 
something that transforms a string to a number, uh, to an integer, and something that uh, uh, transforms an integer into a double. And we can compose those into a single function that takes a string and returns a double. And we do that by saying f1, and then f2, and then f3. So that form of functional composition is a lot different than what you would do in object land. So think about what you would do in object land if you had you know, these three different disparate methods for doing different things. You would basically say, call method one. Now you might put parens around things, or you might chain the dots. If you're lucky, you could chain the dots. Or you might say, intermediate rep, uh, value one equals perform method on thing. Intermediate value two equals perform um, other method on intermediate value one. Intermediate value three is perform the last thing on intermediate value two, now return intermediate value three. Now, there, there are two problems with that. The first one is verbosity, because at some point, your eyes glaze over, because if it's more than a screen full of code, it's pretty difficult for most humans to like keep it in their local cache. At least that's true with me. Um, but more importantly, it's not something that you can just um, snap together like Legos and return. So you can't return this thing that can then be used by other things and even composed by other things when you have all of these intermediate representations. So you know what you do is you create one of these little utility classes that has one of these methods on it, and you call it with construction, constructor parameters. Or, or maybe what you do is you create a static method, which static methods are just a pain in the butt for everybody, including the uh, um, JVM implementation. You do all this stuff, and it's harder to take these little granular bits of logic build them together into a coherent whole that you call your program. So the other thing that you can do is if you have a list of these functions, and the list of functions actually becomes really, really nifty, because if you have a list of functions, you can dynamically compose the list of functions. You can then compose that dynamically composed list of functions. So you, know, you um, have a choice, you have a list of functions, and maybe someplace in the middle you're taking the average, and based on some other variable you choose to use mean versus median versus mode. Mode? Mode. Um, but you can choose your average function, which takes a list of things in, a list of numbers in, and returns the average value of those numbers. And when you have a list of functions, you can actually, using a very simple um, one-liner, take that list of functions and compose them into a single function, which is really nifty. So I've basically gone through, performed a bunch of logic, built up my list of functions, and then turned that list of functions into a single function in a single line of code. And before you scoff, I do that on a non-trivial basis in my daily Scala coding. So I'm going to make an aside, and the aside is namespace. So one of the big challenges that I have with Haskell is there are, I don't know, seven or eight different map functions that I use on a regular basis. And you map over a list, you map over a, a map, you map over a set, and it turns out that the map implementations are a little bit different. There's fmap, and there's like some other stuff that, you know, over time the, the Haskell guys basically added a lot of the same type classes to a lot of the different um, type implementations so that you can use fmap and you can do a couple of other things. But at the end of the day, I wind up with having to preface the namespace of the map function that I actually care about using with the um, type that I'm going to be operating on. So that map corresponds to a thing which is actually, you know, a, a um, key value, uh, collection of key values, and then I apply a function to it. So one of the, the more glorious things about Scala is you don't have to have a lot of that namespace polluting up your code. So uh, with Scala, when I call the map method on thing, if thing is a list, it calls the lists map method. If thing is a key value map, 
then the map method is called on the key value map. And some of the actually pretty cool things that came along with Scala 2.8 is the way that, they, that Scala uses implicits to actually allow you to have a reduced set of implementations and then just choose the differences um, at runtime. So, or at, I'm sorry, at compile time. But one of the, one of the things that um, you can think of with methods on a class is they're functions, but they're scoped to a particular namespace, which I find is a very useful thing rather than having to call out the namespace like I do in Haskell land. Anyway, with that aside, a render pipeline. So here's another slide full of code that actually defines how hoisted, which is the uh, thing that transforms a set of incoming files into a set of um, web pages for display, actually does its rendering. And the reason why I separated it out into a pipeline was um, recently I've been kind of mucking around with different ways that hoisted does its thing and I wanted to be able to build discrete components and channel the input through the, the input set of files through the discrete components. And it turns out that building a default way of building up the rendering pipeline was really cool. And then I realized that I wanted to insert a phase. And it was really easy to insert the phase because I just inserted it into the method that returned the list of uh, phases that the rendering pipeline goes through. So you know, what do we do? We, uh, we have a box of list of parsed files. So parsed file is a single file on the file system that's been parsed, or alternatively, it's a file on the file system that can't be parsed but should be copied, or alternatively, it can be a synthetic thing. So it shouldn't really be called parsed file, but um, it's legacy because you know I wrote it two weeks ago, and so therefore, I have that yeah, shut up. Um, so we have a list of those. It could be any kind of sequence, any kind of collection. Um, and we have a box. So one of the things that I did in Lyft back, let's see, five years ago, more than five years ago, it was over the summer when I was on the Jersey Shore with my dad in a beach house. Um, yes, I code Scala when I'm on the Jersey Shore on vacation because, well, you know, you just got to do that. Um, Scala's option uh, didn't return uh, error information. And um, there was a Haskell either that can either be um, have useful information or error information, but it turns out that uh, the implementation of either that was in the Scala standard library uh, wasn't really mapping friendly, and there were a whole bunch of other things that it wasn't really friendly about. So um, I came up with box, which is kind of an intersection of option and validation. So box can be full like some, it can be empty, like none, or it can be failure. And it's actually not an algebraic data type because there's a subclass of failure called param failure that you can pass additional parameters in. And failure captures um, a string value of the failure, it captures a chain of other failures, and it also captures a chain of exceptions. So basically, if there's an exception that led to the failure, you can actually capture that. And it turns out that Box has served us really well in Liftland because it allows for uh, really nice for comprehensions to de define what you're going to do in returning a REST request because on, fail um, on empty Box, you can actually assign a failure message to the empty Box and then assign a failure code, and that gets turned into the you know, uh, 401, 404, not found because this you know, parameters out of bounds, whatever. It's just, it, it works out well. Anyway, so we have a box of parsed files that go in and we get a box of parsed files that go out. The nifty thing about having boxes in and boxes out is that at any point during the render pipeline, if we have a failure or an empty box, the render pipeline continues. The, the values continue to get propagated through, but because the render pipeline is expecting um, a full box, it will, only op you know, it will only operate on a full box, it passes the non-full box on through. So what we do is we have exception handling or error handling, because as Marius said, exceptions are reserved for exceptional situations. Is there something unexpected like memory, out of memory? Is there something unexpected like my database 
it, you know, I no longer have a database connection. Things that are expected, like divide by zero or some other stuff, you know, those are part of the normal chain of computation, and those should just be passed around as values as part of the normal chain of computation. So we basically define what to do um, throughout the rendering of, you know, throughout the transformation of the raw input files into your website. And you do this, and it's simple, and it's understandable, and it's actually should be readable by everybody in the room. Now, you probably don't know what each of the phases do, but hopefully the names of the phases are sufficiently descriptive that you go, oh, remove removed? That must remove the stuff that's been marked removed. Uh huh. Um, update header metadata. Well, I guess each of those parse files has metadata and some headers, and so that must update the metadata. Okay, so we get all that. So let's go back to OO land for a minute. And we look at OO land and we look at um, having a list of students. So, you know, we have a collection of students and we want to figure out the average age of the students who have taken a particular class. And so if we're pure subclassy maniacs, the thing that we do is we create a subclass of list of students so that we can add our logic in there. Now, you'll notice the line at the bottom. No, we never actually do this in the real world. What we do in the real world is we create static methods or functions that perform the same logic. But, you know, in, in our pretend forced OO example, we're going to say, okay, we have this collection. Now, one of the things that this implies is that you have a mutable state in the collection. Because if we have a Scala-style collection where we have a, um, a persistent reference, if we add a new element to the collection, we have to return a collection type of exactly the same type. So we have to have a lot of tortured logic if we have a persistent collection, if we have persistent references, we have to have a lot of tortured logic for creating two minutes, Okay, sorry. Okay, you, you know, it, he came over with the baseball bat. So um, basically, it implies that we have to have mutability here because if we don't have mutability here, when we create the list of students, as we add new students, we get back to the old list rather than a list of students. Now, the next thing that we do is we see that we've got, you know, four lines of a little bit of logic to create the average um, age. And, you know, what do we do? We basically say, well, we have some mutable state here, or mutable variables, and we get our classes, and if the classes contain the class that we care about, then we increment the count, we increment the sum, and we return the sum divided by the count, hoping that the count is not zero. So, I'll skip this slide. Um, let's compose this. So we basically create a function called contains things, and the first thing that we do is we pass in a function that converts A to a list of B. And then we have a B. And then in the next block of parameters, we have a list of A. So what we do is we basically say, we're gonna filter the list of A by applying the function to B, so getting the classes that the student is in, and then seeing whether that contains B. But this is a much more generic way of representing the same logic because our logic is not embedded in our code. We're just simply saying, okay, you know, there's the, we have a collection of things and the collection of things can return another collection of things and we're gonna see whether that other collection of things contains a value. More importantly, we have average. So we say that if our list is empty, then we're gonna return none. There's no legal value if we have zero items in our list. Otherwise, we're going to um, convert our list to, in, um, our item to an integer, and then we're going to reduce left by adding up all the values, and then we're going to divide by the length of the list. So that if we want to figure out students by age by class, we basically say, contains things, get current class, class, and then average over get age, and then we apply that to our list. So we've built up our logic by partially applying 
the more generic functions to make them less generic and more um, concrete, and then composing those more concrete functions together um, and applying those to our data. Um, this is monoids, I won't get there. Um, Shirley you curry. So one of the things that we saw in the prior example is we had these methods that returned functions. And so basically um, the methods were partially applied. So they had a, a block of parameters and then uh, parens and another block of parameters. So those kind of roughly fall into the um, a function that takes an A, that returns a function that takes a B, that returns a C. And so what you do is you partially apply the functions. You um, apply some parameters, but not all of the parameters to the function. And then those partially applied functions are functions that you can use in other places. It, what that winds up doing is it puts the state into functions, but because the state is, because you have a persistent um, reference, your, your graph of objects is persistent, um, that, that state doesn't change as long as you have a reference to the function. Um, yeah, 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 but state. So like how do functional languages deal with state? Oh no, the hook is coming. One more minute. So in Erlang, because this, this is where the really funny joke comes in. Um, in Erlang, you put state into processes. So you basically send messages to actors. So you send a message, you, you send anything to an actor, and you get no response, you get unit. Your execution continues, you don't know what happened on the other side. In Haskell, we put our state in monads. <laughs> um, sorry, that was the joke. You also have functional reactive programming, which is um, starting to get some good industry, liter uh, industry literature. Um, and functional reactive programming basically is a lot like the um, parser combinator, except it defines state transitions for user interfaces. And it's a place where Haskell is actually starting to shine. And with Scala, um, I put my state in thread locals and just basically set up a, a thread local um, environments so that w whatever code is executing in that thread can put stuff into the variables, pull stuff out of, out of what looks like global variables, and that's how we manage state. Um, forget that, uh, better than a donkey. So, you know, it's not quite a, the functional composition isn't quite a unicorn, but it's better than a donkey. Um, you know, it's, it's hard, but it ultimately leads to um, more easily managed code. The side effects are kept to a minimum, and I hate the side effect purists because you know it's like purism. Um, I won't tolerate intolerance. Never mind. Um, it's also evolving, so we're seeing combinators, we're seeing functional reactive programming, we're seeing a lot of stuff to make this um, declarative functional composing thing easier. But it's not a unicorn, but it's better than a donkey, and I better get off stage before Andy uh, kills me. Thank you, guys. For Micronautics Research for Pragmatic Scala Training, Architectural Design, Implementation, and Systems Integration. Ask about our complimentary introductory presentations on Scala today.